Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about reasons to be a home canner and food preserver, and also do's and don'ts of home canning. As well as our guest, she is master canner and preserver right here in Milwaukee County, and a new author, Christina Ward, will be with us. As well as your garden questions, canning questions, and our answers. All that starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, or anywhere in between, I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, who is always with me. Holly Baird. This show is brought to you by great sponsors that you'll hear throughout the program. And ex- executive sponsors like... Nassala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden and Radio Show. Nassala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because it was not Nassala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nassala.com. And you can call in with your garden questions anytime during the show on the ivyorganics.com 3-in-1 plant guard hotline. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 plant guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces for use on your fruit, roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. And, and you can call 414-444-5250. Those are the digits in which you can get a hold of us uh, to talk about that. Well, we had a great turnout. Uh, it's all about canning today. And we had a great turnout at McGuanagall this past, what day was it, uh, Thursday? Tuesday. 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 Mm-hmm. And we want to welcome those who are listening on the AM side uh, that uh, joined us. We had a great crowd, talked about uh, basics of canning. And we're happy to have them along for the journey on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, as well as uh, we don't have any talks until uh, August, August, August now. August first, yeah. But you can find all of that under the Come See Us tab on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com website. And uh, you know, it's the Fourth of July weekend. We hope you have a safe weekend. But we want you to reflect and remember why we have this holiday that we are able to celebrate. And it's, uh, you know, there's going to be barbecues and parades and fireworks and adult beverages consumed. But the reason why we have that are because the men and women who put on the uniform every day, uh, taking no, no, uh, they just, they do it because they want to serve their country. And those who have served and those who are currently serving, uh, we have a great deal of gratitude and thank you for that, whether you've served multiple rounds of uh, duty in Iraq or you are in the reserves or anywhere in between. We thank you very much for your service and for allowing us to uh, do what we do and be free, whether you like what's going on in the country or not. This is still the greatest country in the world, and we thank you for your service and your uh, gratitude towards protecting all of us. So with that being said, uh, let's get into the topic at hand today, which is basics of, well, not so much basics of canning, but uh, canning itself. Why should we can or look at why we should can our produce, whether we grow it ourselves in the garden, buy it from the grocery store, or buy it from the farmer's market? Right, so... You may say, okay, we have grocery stores all over, convenience stores. I can go down the block and I can pick up, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, that's something my grandparents did. Why should I do that now? And I think one of the the biggest reasons is because you're going to know what's in your food, which we've talked about several several times. And not so much chemical-wise, but salts and preservatives, too, because a lot of this stuff has a lot of sodium in it. Yeah. 
Um, and then also, you don't even have to necessarily can. You can also freeze. There are some different fermentation things you can do. And even some vegetables will stay good um, in a freeze, in a fridge or even a cool area. like Without any, yeah, without any with preparation at all. Right. So it's something that's something to think about, too, is how maybe you can um, save your food a little bit longer. And uh, with that being said, uh, the basic the canning is the extension of the harvest. Right. We're, we're extending the harvest because if you pick strawberries today, you've got about a 48-hour period before you can put those strawberries back in the compost pile because they're no good, because they're, they, just, they perish that quickly. So whether you can them, freeze them, dehydrate them, whatever, true enough, refrigeration will expand that life of that vegetable or fruit somewhat. But uh, canning was designed well before refrigeration. You know, this is back in the late 1800s is when canning really came to be. And it was a way of preserving that, that produce so you could have something to eat in winter because there wasn't, you know, be, uh, beans and barley or, or woodmans to run to the store in 1897. Right. So there's that reason. Um, so may, you may not need that now, but you never know what's going to happen. We live... In, we live in Wisconsin where during the winter there could be a bad storm. You could be left. We live in the Wisconsin when the win- in the summer it could be a bad storm. Right. Yeah. Um, so there could be, you know, uh, an electric outage, and then you could have food that's ready uh, essentially to and eat. And it's not really prepping. It's just being prepared. I mean, you, that's being self-sufficient. Self- self-sufficient. Uh, I grew up on a farm in southern Illinois. It was a 15 to 20-minute drive to go to the grocery store if you wanted anything. So when you went to the grocery store, you just didn't go buy a head of cabbage. You went and made a list, and you went once a week, and you got everything. And if you forgot something, well, we'll get it next week. Uh, we didn't have the convenience, uh, you know, of just down the street or across the street. Right. So then the nice thing about it also is that you're learning a new skill. Now, some people might not find that interesting, but I think that as a as a person, I like to learn new things, and that is something that you can you can learn yourself, and is something that you can kind of bring up in conversation. You you know, bored at work talking to coworkers. Hey, by the way, I canned some pickles last night. You know, it's even, even if those coworkers, and yeah, family. even if those coworkers don't like you, they're going to ask questions. Right. They they definitely are. They're going to be like, what? So it's something kind of kind of different. Um, this, you know, in 2017. Now, now with the canning, with anything, gardening, canning, auto repair, computer, whatever, there is an investment, there is some time that's put into it, and there is uh, upfront cost. That's just the way life is. You're not going to, or I haven't figured out very many occupations where you can walk into something and they hand you a bunch of money and say, hey, it's yours, play with what you got. You know, you've got to put some time and money and, and, and investing into this procedure, right. but the reward is that as you do it more and more, the cost goes down and down and down. That's part of learning a new skill. Typically, if you're going to learn something new, there's going to be some sort of upfront cost, and that, that goes hand in hand with this. The other thing, even if you're not concerned about power outages or anything like that, it's convenient. If you have home canned food, it's first of all, it's going to save you money if you're going to the store and buying salsa every week or pasta sauce or anything pickles. really pickles you have that there at your home say like you come home from work one day and you're like i really don't feel like making dinner you can cack, crack open a can of tomato soup make some grilled cheese and you have a quick, really uh, we, quick we dinner. can a lot of potatoes and it's just very easy to open them up warm them up for in well we do it on the stove but you can do it in the microwave for a couple of minutes and it's good to go you don't have to peel them you don't have to heat them to make them soft they're they're ready to go right uh, so you're kind of preparing now enjoying later and you are you, it's a it's a convenient thing. You think going to the store is convenient? Well, you have your store right right in your house. Now, like I talked about earlier, you may not have three thousand acres to grow this stuff, but at the peak of summer, or as we're getting into the peak of summer, you know it's easy to buy five, ten, fifteen, twenty pounds of tomatoes at an extremely low cost compared to what it would be in December to buy store bought tomatoes that we've all tasted and. Cardboard most times takes, tastes better than the, the, the so-called ripe tomatoes that we get at the grocery store in December. So you can buy in bulk very easily and, it's, and then pr- uh, prepare this stuff in canning and you'll have it ready to go all year round. And we, we mentioned potatoes and tomatoes and pickles. There's a vast variety of hundreds of the other different types of canning 
uh, recipes in which you can prepare your canned goods, your your eggplants, your peppers, your zucchini, all of that stuff. That you know the tomatoes, the tomato sauce, and the the pickles and the salsa. That's kind of the most common, obviously. Now, uh, real quickly, and, and we'll get into the do's and don'ts in the next next segment. But for people who are tuning in who's never canned a thing in their life before, and maybe remember this as a, a, a younger that their family or somebody they knew canned, what would be the best thing that they could go and and try to can to begin with? If they're going to go, hey, I want to can something this year because I think I, I, sh- I should kind of learn this, what's the best thing that they can proceed to try? I guess something probably like um, salsa or pickles or pasta sauce. Those are typically three things that are pretty pretty easy. And, and we, we don't have to uh, have all this high-tech equipment. You can do what's called refrigerator pickling. Right. You can do refrigerator pickling. It's not, it's pickling. not long-term. You can we we did some microwave jam the other day. That'll be out on the on the website tomorrow. And that's not necessarily preserving, but that does if you have a lot of berries, that's going to give you some jam for probably about a week or so. So that's something, and it tastes a lot better than store bought. That's for sure. Right, and, and it's it, a lot more fresh. It didn't last very long. No, <laughs> uh, it disappeared pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, so you know what you need what you need to know, or you know before you can, um, it, it's it's pretty simple. But it's one of these things you've got to pay attention. It's not, well, I can cut corners here. Uh, right. We'll get to that in the yeah. next segment. But So if you if you are thinking about doing some canning, and we'll talk about this in the next segment as well, just some good resources, but just make sure that you're always using your head, you're being safe, and that remembering that canning is a science. And you, in with the investment thing, if you cook in your home, you have like, I don't know, probably 75% of the things already that you need. You just need some other things, and you might even have some of that stuff you can improvise to make it into, you know, more for for canning friendly. So when we come back, we will get into the do's and don'ts of canning because some people may not have a clue of what is right and wrong, and it's a lot easier when you know what the rules are so you know what not to break right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit Bobex.com. B-O-B-B. I have a growing family and I try to make healthy meals. And one thing I really love about Woodman's is that they have a huge selection of fresh fruits and vegetables. And the quality is really good too. They even carry locally grown produce. And they keep the prices low. So I can stay within my budget and put a healthy meal on the table. I'm Cameron and this is my Woodman's. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. 
It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. The Wisconsin is your destination for all things gardening. Over 925 videos, short and long format, under the radio tab, under the highlights, and just everything in between. Well, everything in between, uh, we're, we're in the season of peach peaches and blueberries, and they're coming to Milwaukee. They've been to Milwaukee, and they're going to come again. To, based on where you're at, uh, they may be coming pretty soon rather than later. All right. So if you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can find up Find out where to pick up top quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have the peaches and blueberries now. They're fresh and they're really delicious. You can pick them up right in the stop in your neighborhood all over southeast Wisconsin, um, including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. And they are starting their blueberries now. Starting um, July 3rd. Yeah, July so, 3rd. Uh, Monday. And then it also includes they have their market trucks that they have those at the different uh farmer's market so if you go to tree-ripe.com that's where you can find them and even after uh peach and blueberry season i think sometimes they have pecans too but then in the winter they have uh citrus yes yeah, so uh, check them out tree-ripe.com you can also find that under the radio tab at the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com well let's talk about do's and don'ts of canning uh there's a lot of things in life if you don't know the rules and you break them it's not a big deal Canning is not one of those genres in which you can break the rules and be okay. We're going we're gonna to go over what you should do and what you shouldn't do and the reasons why those uh, parameters are set for you. So we talked earlier about canning is a science. Right, so canning is a science, um, and that basically means that when you're cooking, say you're making some, you're making some homemade uh pasta sauce you might toss in a few extra things with canning you, you do not want to do that right and we want to follow the recipe to the t yes so you want to follow the recipe and then also you want to read that recipe before you get started we've come across times where we start a recipe and then it says you have to let it sit in salt water for three hours if you start that recipe at the wrong time of day, you might be finishing that recipe at... Well, at, um, Jerusalem artichoke relish, right. you, you have to let the, the artichoke soak for 24 hours. And I think it's something similar for some sweet pickles, too. You have to let them sit in a brine as well. So you're not going to get this done in a couple hours on a Sunday night before you go to work on Monday morning. No, that would uh, be... So, yeah. and, and in addition to that, you want to make sure you have all the ingredients. Yes. Because you just can't skip an ingredient because you don't have it because that alters the whole science of this whole preserving thing and you may have pickles that are bad the longevity is not there there's a reason why and they're they're the recipes are the way they are and then on top of that with not not just pickles or something um you want to think about and we'll talk about this too is using the proper method bo- boiling water versus pressure canning so pressure canning is for low acid foods and that ensures that you can have the the proper things removed from it and it's going to be properly stored because there's good things, bad things in your soil, good things, bad things in your food. When it comes to food preserving where you're not using it in your refrigerator or freezer, when you're storing it on a shelf, you want to make sure those things are stored properly and it's gone to the right temperature. Right. And when in doubt, toss it out. This is pretty much with any type of food, but it's especially important with your canned goods in which you have already canned that are on the shelf or that your friend or family member or neighbor have gave you. We open our canned goods up, and the first thing we do is we smell it. That's a universal, your body is keen to, you know if something doesn't smell right. Smell isn't always going to be the the insurity. No, but, but it you, makes but a difference. It does so, make a difference. You know if something immediately is off off tilter. You know something doesn't smell quite right. The other thing you want to look at is the color of it. Does it look like tomatoes? Does it look like corn? I mean, is the color relatively close? Like if you see something weird enough? floating on the top of the jar, you, you don't want to eat that. Right, and, and even if you get you know jars of canned goods from a basement from your aunt who has passed away and they're labeled 1996 don't be a oh i'm not going to be a wasteful person pour that stuff out the jars are still good don't use the contents in the jar let's be smart about this 
So the other thing is I want to mention is be be clean when you can. I know that seems obvious, but make sure that you have, you know, your whatever you're using to stir and scoop, that that's clean. Your jars are nice and clean. Everything that you use is clean and as sterile as possible. Your cats, your dogs are away, out of the room. Right, any pets, um, any... Any sort of situation that could, you know, leave something foreign in your jar like a dog or cat. Or if you you don't want to just, you know, bring out the whatever you cooked dinner last night and that possibly could have something contaminated in it. Steril- make sure, sterilization. Make sure it's clean. And that's that's in any food prep really. And then if you're if you are canning anything with meat in it, you want to make sure that you're doing it right and then that food is um is safe as well, so don't you know have some chicken that's been sitting out for a long time and think, oh, I'm just going to can this now. Now with the meat, let's let's just clarify: you can't water bath meat. You have to. There's a pressure canning procedure right. in which you have to go with. So it's not just a, oh, I'm just going to throw this in a jar and water bath it for 30 minutes. It doesn't work that way. But that's a yeah, that's a whole whole different thing. Right, but I want to make people aware that you just can't go to the uh, Woodman's and pick up some you know hamburger and throw it in a jar and water bath it. There's there's a reason why you have to do these things a certain procedure. And you want to use uh, proper canning jars uh, and lids and ca- equipment. Um, some people will think, okay, I have this old jar here. I can can in it. That's not a good idea. It might be like a mayonnaise jar or a spaghetti jar. You don't know if it's going to be, if it's for canning. So you want to use mason jars or canning jars, as they're called, because they are meant to take the hit and be used over and over again. And you can tell, you know, if you've got an old glass managed jar, it's a very thin-walled jar, and these canning jars are very thick-walled, and we're talking about the, the clear glass. We're not talking about that old blue jar that we most of us are familiar with seeing. Those jars have a lot of hairline fractures. You can collect those if you want. Um, the value, there's not really a whole lot of value because so many thousands were made but you don't want to use those because those hairline cracks when under pressure under you know 212 degree boiling water those will bust the jars um, now the new fancy purple jars that was there right the, the the special edition re-release purple they did purple blue and green those are fine yeah. and you can tell the difference they don't look as i guess as old yeah. <laughs> you know they they definitely look a they lot look newer. modern they look modern yes yeah. Um, and then I wanted to mention, you want to follow a recipe that's been published usually within the past, I would say, safely 10 years. Now, why if, is that? Why can't I use great-grandmother's recipe on canning tomatoes? Well, things have changed. Uh, the food safety has changed and the science has changed. Like, for example, you growing up, you said you guys water bath canned water bath, green beans. Water bath green beans. I believe it was for three hours. Well, now that the the United States Department of... Uh, the National Center yeah, for Home Food Preservation. ...has now frowned upon that and green beans can only be pressure canned safely and we have tried it right and we have you can you know you with the with the beans in the water bath you can pickle them Mm -hmm. you can't just can them right yeah and we have found that we don't like either way we freeze our green beans because they're they've got that snap that crack that pop that we're looking for we just feel that the beans that we pressure canned and the dilly beans well we didn't didn't care much for the dilly beans just because it was too garlicky and, and pickly uh, I, don't, I don't know why i didn't like them but anyway we did, they're, they're just, we, but, with the so canning with we that, didn't like with that being said yeah. um when i talk about high acid versus low acid if you have a pickled recipe you can certainly um you know from a trusted source you can certainly you can certainly can that with the water bath canning i'm not saying that you can't Water bath can things that have uh, addition of acid or sugar to them, and the re- a good recipe will tell you that. Now, wh- where is the best place that we can go if if I've got a recipe that's been passed down or found online? How do I know if it is a trusted source? If it's legit? What's how do I know if it's safe? So, if it's some random blog with a recipe, I'm not going to trust that unless it says. This has been taken from uh, resources resor- from resources from blah blah blah. So, one good resource is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Another good resource is FreshPreserving.com, which is the the ball canning jar website. They have a lot of good recipes on there. Um, and then their books, the ball canning books. Better Homes and Gardens has a lot of good recipes as well. And SB Can S- yeah S so like. Uh, Santa, I think she's in Santa Barbara. So okay. SB Canning, she's a master food preserver in Southern California. She has tons of recipes on her website. So all of those are good resources. And if you ever have any questions, you can certainly email me, and I will 
definitely uh, provide good information for you. Yeah, you can email at twvgradio at gmail dot com with that, as well as we'll be able to get you'll be able to get a hold of uh, the guests coming up, uh, Christina Ward. She'll be able to verify whether or not um, a recipe is safe or not, as well. And I just want to touch yeah. that that re- uh, being safe is is utmost important. Uh, things like botulism and other bad things live in your soil, as we've discussed. You know, there's good things and bad things in your soil. And when it comes to something like botulism, that's not something you want to mess with. And you might think that doesn't exist anymore. But there's been cases in the last less than five years where people have, have died because of it. Because of improper canning procedures. Uh, and they just took shortcuts and they thought, oh, I'll just do it this way. And it didn't, because not doing it right, those pathogens survived the procedure and then was consumed by the, well, it wasn't just the person that canned it. It was a, a, a luncheon. I got a bunch of people sick in Colorado a couple of years ago because of the improper canning procedures. So, right. And I just, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. No. I, I grew up in the city. I never canned until I met Joey. And now I feel co- fully confident in what I'm doing. I, I did take some classes and I've done a lot of reading on it. And I've, I've definitely learned the skill. But the thing is, is that I always keep in the back of my mind that you have to be safe. And not trying to scare you, turn you away from canning. It's just something that does need to be addressed. Now, when, we, when we're looking at canning jars, let's talk about canning jars for a minute before, before we take a break. What, where, where's the best place that we can get canning jars? Maybe we don't want to go somewhere and pay full price. What, what's another alternative in which we can get actual canning jars? Sure. So you can check out things like rummage sales. There's also Craigslist. We found a number of j- uh, jars on Craigslist. And then you never know. You could ask around at your work. You could ask around at your church. It's wherever. amazing how many people have canning yeah. jars in their house, and they have never canned a, a thing in their life. Right. And it is very true. We've gone to estate sales, and even that, remember that one rummage sale you went to, and they had, like, hundreds? Uh-huh. Yeah. So you, you don't know. People just have this stuff sitting around, and they might have some jars in their basement or attic, and you don't know. So if you... If you come across somebody that's like, oh, my blah, 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 used to can, ask them if they have any jars. Right. And, you know, we uh, may be in the exception to the rule. Last year we canned 310 jars of produce out of our garden. Uh, we've got, I think right now, somewhere around 700 jars total in the house. Now, the reason why we have so many, and I'll, I'll explain this, when we go to estate sales or yard sales, we don't do this anymore because we've got to the point where we're, satisfied with the number of jars we just didn't go buy five or six jars if there was an allotment of 50 or 100 jars we would buy them all because we got a much better deal on the jars because we bought all of them versus buying seven or eight here and nine or ten there now with that allotment you've got some jars that were old managed jars or old blue jars or ones that were not canning uh, safe or safe canning jars but Overall, it was well worth, you know, pennies on the dollar versus what you would buy at a convenient uh, at a store. Right. That's that's exactly it. And you also get some really neat looking jars too. So. Oh yeah, you, and they and they are actually canning jars. You know, bicentennial jars, uh, different type of things. So uh, we want that to be uh, relevant. You know, be safe, be smart. Canning is fun. It is money saving. The more you do it, and it's great to enjoy that fresh opened jar of produce in the dead of winter or any time during the year. Well, when it comes to mowing grass, we want to have good equipment, and errands can help us out with that piece of good equipment. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. For more, visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. Same uh, same zip code for over 80 years, uh, so good quality equipment. When we come back, the master canner and food preserver of Milwaukee County be, will be with us. Christina Ward, right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah nasala 
To note, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family-owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more. Even kosher and gluten-free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HodgsonMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at GreenstockGarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and purchase, visit greenstockgarden.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. Eight or nine hundred and twenty five videos. I always forget how many videos because we've just got so many. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. You can find all that and a whole lot more there. Well, Blue Mel's, the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, is a got they, they have a contest that they have each year, and it's been extended because they had so many requests for uh, people wanting to participate in the contest. And it's uh, you asked for it, and they've listened. The deadline for submitting your entries for the 2017 Blue Mel's Beautification Award competition has been extended. You now have until Friday, July 7th, to enter your flower, garden, and container garden uh, in those categories. Uh, to to win some stuff, so you can find more of that, more information at bluemills.com and uh, bluemills. They still got landscape material, uh, mulches, compost, anything anything you need for all your gardening and landscape needs, and a whole lot more. And more yeah. knowledgeable staff, family owned and operated. They've been around since 1955. Um, so you can go to bluemills at 4930 West Lemus Road in Greenfield, and call bluemills or go to bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. Tell them that uh, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener said uh, uh, that come and say hi. And you can see all of their uh, wonderful stuff, their playground, their coffee shop, the whole deal. Well, let's go to the ivyorganics.com hotline and bring in our next guest, Holly. Christina Ward is a certified master food preserver for Milwaukee County. She is a Milwaukee native who teaches canning classes, volunteers in the community, and sells unique jams and jellies at local farmer's markets. Christina is also an advocate for safe canning and food preserving. I have taken many of her classes and learned a great deal from her. She's also the author of the recent book, Preservation, the Art and Science of Canning, Fermentation, and Dehydration. Welcome to the program, Christina. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join Holly, myself, and all of our listeners to, to make us safer when it comes to canning. It's always my pleasure to spread the good word about safe food preservation practices. So, um, in your book, you kind of touch on this, and it's a very nice book, well-written, and I just want to ask, why do we need master food preservers in our communities? I think the, the MFPs and master food preservers ser- serve a really important role, and it primarily it's about getting the information, the latest and greatest scientific research, out to people. And it's a way to teach it. I mean, we're so disconnected sometimes by what our grandparents did and what our parents did. We want to know, but we also have to acknowledge that science moves forward, and we're smarter scientifically than we were, say, 50 years ago. And so the MFP, um, that job, you know, that role, that volunteer role, is to get that science out to the community. Well, and that's the thing. You know, everybody wants to carry on that uh, heirloom 
a recipe from their great grandmother from 1897, but we've learned now, like you just spoke about, that's not really the safest. It's great to put in a frame and hang above the mantle, but it's not good to go ahead and try to put that recipe in a jar and, and expect it to be safe in 2017. It is. I mean, exactly. And that's where your MSP in your county can help you out, too, is that there's ways, there's updated recipes. So you can take your grandmother's recipe, and once you understand some of the science behind it, and you can consult with your MSP, they can take a look and and say, okay, your recipe is great, and if you do this one small thing differently, you'll get your great-grandmother's pickles or jam and still have it be safe for your family. Now, you were uh, on Fox 6 this past week, and you and I watched that segment, great segment. You brought up a term in which I didn't know existed, which was Milwaukee pickles. Now, Holly, are you familiar with what Milwaukee pickles are? No. Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, Christine, would you define what the difference between a Milwaukee pickle is and the rest of the country pickle are? Yeah, Milwaukee pickles are unique. I mean, Milwaukee and Wisconsin have such a great ethnic kind of immigrant history. And so Milwaukee dills are very much like a hybrid of that Eastern German, Polish style of uh, vinegar pickling. And really what, what sets it apart is our combination of spices. And so our pickling spice, which um, one of my favorites is always at Penzi's, locally owned Penzi spices, it includes clove. Clove and our salad pickle also is very heavy on the mustard seed and the turmeric. And it gives our pickles a little bit of a different taste. If you go to other places in the country or buy more, you know, brands that are not originated from Milwaukee, you'll notice that difference. Now, we get this question a lot when Holly does the basics of canning classes, uh, uh, teaches, you know, the, the courses. What, my pickles are soft. They don't have the, the snap. Uh, what is your secret to getting your pickles to get that pop that you were familiar with with store-bought? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple different things, and it's always in the production um, and the, your home production. Uh, first of all, I always say you have to think about what your goal is. If you're thinking about, like, the quote-unquote Vlasic-style refrigerator pickles, you're never going to get that if you're canning them in a hot water process. And that's okay. So make refrigerator pickles and know that they're not going to last as long. If you're looking for the jarred, long shelf life pickles, then you're going to process them. And the mistake that most people make that results in a soggy pickle is that they're moving too slow. And what I mean by that is they're not using the freshest cucumbers they can possibly get. You want to use as fresh as possible. Um, and then you're actually, people are processing them too long. They're leaving them too in the jars. You need to move with speed and purpose. Get those in the jar get the uh, pickling solution over them, get them processed, and get them out of the canner as soon as they're done. And that kind of goes with any canning procedure. You just don't want to lollygag around and take your sweet time. You, you, this is a time-sensitive thing. It is. It is. And that's, you know, the timing on a recipe is calculated for you. And that's there's a, a whole bunch of um, algebra that and physics that goes into how long should a jar be submerged to create the vacuum seal, push out any extra oxygen, and make that safe. So, you know, don't mess around and don't decide that, well, I'm going to only, you know, process for half that time because of, you know, I need to go and, have, you know, go out to lunch. You can't do that. If you're, if you're processing, if you're making stuff for food preservation, you need to kind of commit to the project and see it through to the end. Now, there's... You know, Holly and I are lazy. I'll admit that. I'm sure you're probably lazy in some aspects of life. But oh, when, it, when, it comes, when it comes to canning, uh, people, you know, the, the recipe says need a half inch of headspace. Well, I've got a little extra. I'm just going to top the jar off, put it in the canner, and be done with it. There, there's a reason why there's a headspace uh, requirement for all canning procedures, correct? Absolutely. And it goes back to that algorithm of... There's a relationship between that negative space in the jar, the material, what you're, what you're canning, the jar, and the processing time. And so if you change, drastically change one of those elements, you're essentially, the results will be unsafe. Whether if you haven't left, a, if you uh, underfilled your jar, that means that there still could be oxygen in there. And if there's oxygen, there could be microbes. And you've just created this like beautiful anaerobic environment. And anaerobic is the key, meaning without oxygen, because the deadliest of all of the microbes are anaerobic ones, and I'm talking about botulism. And so there's never any amount of laziness that if the result is death, 
you don't get to be lazy. You have to do it the right way. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for touching on that. So if I see, a, and on that note, if I see a recipe just randomly shared online, maybe I'm looking at my favorite bloggers' recipes and they're showing a, like a canning recipe or in a Facebook group or who knows where, um, should I assume it's safe? And how do I know? Or should I only trust? Should I only use trusted resources? How do I how do I be the best safe canner when it comes to this day and age where everything is so true on the internet? Well, it, there's a combination of things you can do to arm yourself against unsafe practices. First of all, and I'd like, to, and that's what my book was trying to is trying to address with folks is if you understand the basic scientific concepts of what you're doing and why you're doing it, you will be able to recognize when a recipe and a product is unsafe. For example, there are folks that are trying to uh, can low-acid foods in a hot water bath, something low-acid, say, like just a jar of potatoes, and they're like, well, we'll just boil it longer. Well, fundamentally, because you're not um, getting the temperatures to where they need to be to drive out any microbial life, you're, you're making something unsafe. And if you know that super high temperatures are what kill botulism, you'll know when you see that recipe saying, uh-uh, that's not safe. When you're starting out, going to trusted websites is, is a good place to go. The, the, again, the extension service, uh, throughout the country in the Center for Home Food Preservation has a vast repertoire of tested recipes that are free and available to access, um, on the online. And that's a great place to start. Now, people have done canning for a number of years and different practices. And one, one question, uh, we get a lot of questions, and I'm sure you do too, is, my grandmother, and not mine, but this is the question, my grandmother, when she pulled the canning jars out of the canner, she would flip them upside down on the cabinet. What, what, was the, what was the reason for that? And I know that is not a safe practice, but what was, what was the mindset behind people who did that? Oh, you know, and, and that's so funny. It's so funny how we have like these, it's like an appendix memory. So we remember Grandma did it, and so we do it because that's what, we, she, what she did. But again, it comes back to understanding the science. A lot of folks actually didn't hot water bath things. They just didn't understand enough about germ theory to understand that high temperatures would kill microbes. So the old-fashioned way would be to pour paraffin wax over the whatever the material in the jar was. And then after the wax begins to seal, they'd flip them over and with the idea that you, you get a good seal, there's no oxygen. Well, now we know that it, that's just not true. Um, how small microbes are, that there's no way that would happen. But again, so that memory of flipping jars has kind of passed along, even with the two-part lid. So this is something that people did in the 30s, 40s, and yet then started, even as modernity, as the new lids kind of came into onto the market, they would still keep flipping jars. Again, so there's no need to do it. It's not really safe at all, um, because again, you create some pressure against the lid as it's trying to seal. So, again, that's one of the reasons for the Master Food Preserve is the idea of getting that information out there. What was safe in 1920 is not necessarily safe today. Thank you. And so, other than canning, real quickly, what are some other good ways anyone can preserve food? There's so many different uh, methods and techniques out there. And so, fermentation is enjoying a resurgence. And we're talking about, like, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, fermented pickles. Uh, so that's a great way. To, again, a real fun to experiment with trying that. And fermentation is essentially your bacterial farming. Instead of just driving out all microbes, you're inviting the good ones in and to create a form of acid to preserve the food. And the other one is dehydration. Again, removing any of the water. Removing water essentially extends the life of your food. So dehydration, again, another great method for preserving food. And you talked about, you know, the, the microbes and the, and the disease and all that stuff that we're getting out of the jar properly canning. Uh, there's people who will go, well, I'm just going to save on lids and reuse lids again. For $2.50, is it really worth the risk of death to save a few bucks by reusing lids that are not designed to be reused? Absolutely not. And the same thing with, like, reusing old peanut butter jars. They're not designed to be used multiple times. And here's the, when I get asked that question or people scoff, um, I, and here's what I say. I say, do you really want your family to have your obituary read you died because of a bad jar of potatoes or jam? No. That's ridiculous. So there's just no reason to not do things the safe way. 
Right. You're going to save more money by canning it correctly than you are going to buy something that you have no idea where it came from, what was put in it, and, and be happy and healthier that way. Absolutely. And that's a, there's the economic reasons, especially you You guys are the gardeners. People listening are gardening. What a great way to extend your harvest by doing a little food preservation, whether it's fermenting, dehydrating, or canning. All that hard work you put into growing your vegetables, you get to enjoy them year-round. And there's nothing that eating something that you made, um, you know, you harvested and made and cracking open a jar in February when it's cold out. Well, yeah, definitely. We couldn't agree more. So how can people find your book, classes, and even where you sell your jams? I'm, I'm a bit retired from selling jams right now, um, so kind of taking a break. Um, and so, But there are other great uh, local sellers in, in on the market in Milwaukee area and in Wisconsin, so definitely seek them out, ask them questions about their practices, and then support them. Uh, my book is available at independent bookstores all over the country as well as on Amazon. Uh, if you've and, not if you've not got her, uh, Christina's book, you need to look at it because it's well. It, it, it's got a lot of information, and Christine, you've done a very well job of putting this book together. You didn't put no fluff in there. It was it's all serious. It's it's about canning and oh, what you need to know. Not complete. There's some really good stories. Well, in there's too, good yeah. stories, but it gets to the point. It's not just you know. It, it's important. You're trying to get the message out there, and you you did a very well, uh, very good job with that in your book. Well, thank you. Um, and my goal again is always to, so, you know, not, don't be, I want, I don't want people to be afraid of the science. The science, if you just understand it at a high level and I try to make it easy to understand so you, you can apply it to your food preservation practices without needing the degree in microbiology. Absolutely. Well, Christine, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of uh, your day to join Holly and myself and our listeners to advise us on better and safer canning procedures, uh, and, and we thank you for that. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. Happy preservation, everyone. Thank you, Christina. And we'll be back right after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. Have a gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414 414- Four 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 five two five zero. Right now. Beans and Barley Market and Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice. A health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccess.com. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Now, for people who are scoring at home or by themselves, we are the only garden radio show in Milwaukee, produced in Milwaukee. Yeah. We're the only one. We're number one. Yeah. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, 925-plus videos, digital magazines, and a whole lot more. You can contact us there. 
Uh, you can also sign up for a weekly email. You can email us at twvgradio at gmail.com or tweet us at hashtag twvg. And if you've got a gardening question, canning question, you can certainly call into the ivyorganics.com hotline. Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Garden actually protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your fruit roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call with your questions at 414-444-5250. ivyorganics.com, and it's easy, environmentally friendly uh, to use. So we had a number of questions come in on the uh, TWBG radio uh, e- uh, gmail.com email, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and Instagram this week. Uh, one of the first ones, since we just got done talking about canning, is can I safely can in an Instant Pot that I got for my birthday? Right. So Instant Pot is a, essentially a pressure cooker. It's a countertop pressure cooker, and people really like them because they'll cook your dinner quite quickly. From you can what just plug I, it in the wall. From what I understand, yeah. I don't, haven't done much research on the exact uh, appeal of it. But, no, you cannot can in a Instant Pot because you cannot – it cannot proper, properly be guaranteed to be calibrated to reach the correct temperature and pressure that you need consistently uh, for safe canning. That so you no. get with a pressure canner. Right, so no, you do not want to can an Instapot. Uh, another question was, as, are, as, my radish seed, as my radishes go to seed, the, the pods are edible. This was re- reference off an Instagram post that we had. Can I also eat my na- Napa cabbage seed pods if they are green? And the question is yes. Uh, those uh, you'll see the, these odd-looking seed pods at farmers markets, uh, some, sometimes around here. Uh, but you can eat those green pods uh, on the radishes and the the cabbage as well. And the radishes they taste just like the radish bulb. Uh, another question is, uh, how do I or naturally get rid of squash bugs, Holly? And I believe that would be ladybugs. Uh, ladybugs, ladybugs are the number yeah, one and uh, enemy. That would be one. Uh, and hand removal is yeah, another removal. terrible procedure to go through. You can uh, potentially blast them with water, but again, squash leaves are not, they're, they're, they are a little weak, so if you start blasting them with water, you could snap the stem, so you want to be cautious of that. And there's a number of other organic methods, but ladybugs are the first. Hand removal is the second if you don't have the ladybugs. And uh, just be on top of it. Uh, be very aware of what is going on with your garden. What do we got? Um, is can you put glass in compost? Oh, no, is, is, I found glass in compost. Oh, oh yeah. Found, okay. Yeah. Is that bad? Uh, not necessarily bad. Uh, it is unsafe if you're digging your hands through the compost without gloves on. Uh, a lot of these municipalities will compost the yard waste, and they have workers who sort out, you know, stuff that got thrown in the wrong, the wrong container, and they don't catch it and it's glass or plastic or whatever the case may be uh it's not dangerous to the life of the soil glass takes over 500 well estimated 500 yeah to biodegrade so if it's if you find if you see glass it's it's not going to biodegrade just pick it out just pick it out yeah, yeah just pick it out be careful with it uh that it's just one of those things that uh, it may not been sifted right. It may have slipped through. Nothing, it's not going to hurt the compost. So don't be concerned that it's going to hurt the compost at all. So this is a good question. If the vegetables at the store are not labeled organic, how healthy are they to eat? Well, it depends. Um, most of the time they do have pesticides possibly on them. We talked They're not about deadly. They're not, de- they're not deadly. Yet. You can still eat them. There's also certain grocery stores that have now... Um, small very small grocery stores that have moved they may not be organic necessarily but they've removed they don't buy from any growers that use pesticides so they're select the buyers se- yeah select buyers so a lot of times when your concern is about organic versus inorganic it's not necessarily the food it's more or less the what's been sprayed on them well, right uh, now there are some genetically modified vegetables potatoes are one of them not all of them Potatoes are some. Uh, squashes are another one. There's pineapples, uh, papayas, uh, are some genetically modified crops. But the other thing is, is you have to think about it. If it's a, a more soft-bodied vegetable, like or fruit, um, like a strawberry or a potato, 
and it's not organic, you can pretty much guarantee that there's been some pesticides. Well, and our niece is sprayed. allergic right. to store-bought strawberries, but pick your own farm or in our own garden, she's perfectly fine eating those because of that pesticide, That whatever that pesticide is that is sprayed on the plants that reacts to her um, system. So that's, uh, and, and when you see non-GMO on these, lay, on these food products, that's not a mandatory uh, requirement from the United States Department of Agriculture. That is something these independent, these, these growers are doing independently to encourage people to buy their produce over one that may not, that may be GMO free, but just not labeled. So you just got to do your research. Um, you do your research and see what is best for you, your family, and uh, your lifestyle. So, um, another another question is uh, our our board guy here, Debo, just asked what GMO means. Gen- GMO is genetically modified organism. It is when they it, they've been developed in a lab where they've taken the s- DNA. What they do is they splice yeah. DNA from two different two different things. So it could be anything from a fruit and a fish, so that they grow together to help have different favored components so like corn gmo corn is growing so that it resists the pesticides that are being sprayed to reduce the weeds and and some corn is crossed with dna of sa- a salmon that swims in alaska to be more cold tolerant in the northern areas of the united states so it's a science where uh basically if you want to use the term playing god we're altering the dna structure of the grain or fruit in order to get the characteristics that we want to uh, mimic so we can spray stuff on them or they can grow or do certain things that were not ever intended for crops to grow. And that's where people are believing that that alteration of the DNA structure is messing up people's immune systems because we're eating things that the body was never intended to digest. And there's some scientific proof behind it. These companies have done their own testing. But usually if you're doing something and you want... uh, positive results, you may mimic or change the end results of the test to show the public, hey, this is okay. We've done our own test. Not always, you want an independent test, uh, no matter what you do. And uh, GMO, whether you eat it or not, whether you're a farmer or not, that's a decision that you have to make on a personal level. Good question, good question. So let's see here. I use newspaper in my garden beds. Uh, Will that be considered an organic practice? That's kind of a fine line. Well, um, it, it, you want to find out if your paper is printed with soy ink, and that's usually identified somewhere in the print. I think uh, I think it usually is. Yeah, always there are some ink. there are some newspapers that still do a chemical print. Oh, okay. okay. But if you're if that's the biggest thing that you've got going on, it's going to be okay. You can throw it in your your, your compost pile, use it in your garden. What the other chemicals that you know with all the stuff that you've been putting in the um, your, com- your, your garden, your compost, your coffee grounds, your organic matter, that little bit of toxicity, not going to hurt um, with that. We do have a question on the ivyorganics.com hotline. Caller, you have a question? Yes. Do you have any suggestions for a natural way to keep cats uh, from using your garden as a uh, litter box? Natural way of keeping cats from using your garden as a litter box. Uh, you could sp- cats typically don't like the smell of vinegar. But um, also that can mess up the acidity in the soil. That can, you know, screw but some if things you spray up. The, if you spray the parameter. parameter. Mm-hmm. Uh, another way, based on how large your garden bed is, it's people... Small. It's small. Okay. People will take uh, plastic spoons or plastic forks and stick the handle in the ground so the pointy part is up in a pattern in which the cat can't get in there to scratch around. Uh, that's another way. Uh, you can also sprinkle... Uh, chili powder around the perimeter and some in the garden so when they walk they'll ingest that in their nose and they don't like that um again well, we're going to ask this question next week to brown thumb mama she's going to be a guest and she's a great article on her website all about um how to keep cats out of your edible garden as well so those are some tips uh that will help you okay, detour, good. Yeah. detour your cats thank you you're very welcome thank you for listening uh, with that being said holly uh we've got a number of eight companies that make this show possible each and every week. You hear them throughout the show. They're on the radio tab on the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. Nasella Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nasella is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nasella Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at Nasella.com. Next week, programming note 
what should you be looking for in your garden in uh, the summer months here? The problems that you should be looking for that you may not know are there. We're going to go over several of them that you should uh, be vigilant about so you know what to do if they come up and maybe be proactive on some of them, as well as five July garden growing tips or just tips you need to do in your garden that's not uh, that you may not be familiar with, as well as Pam, founder of roundthumbmama.com, be with us. And she has a great website all about uh, easy ways, very easy ways to be healthy and live naturally uh, between your busy lifestyle. And, and when you have kids as well. Um, so that will be coming up next week. We appreciate you listening. We uh, invite you to tune in. You want to, you, you missed any portion of this show or want to revisit it, you can find that under the radio tab on our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. If you want to visit any individual segments or interviews, you can find that under the highlight tab on the right-hand side on the main page. Until next week. I'm Holly Baird. And I'm Joy Baird. And we will see you in the garden.